Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for everything you've already done for us, Lord. We just thank you that this morning we'll get to see you in a new light. The Holy Spirit will reveal the depths of who you are to us. Reveal your wonder to us, Lord. Open our eyes so we can see. Open our ears so we can hear your words, Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Welcome to church, everyone. My name is Pastor Tim. It's great to have you all with us this morning. This morning's message I've titled, To Know Him. I want to start off by reading Hebrews chapter 12. We can all just be upstanding with the reading of the word this morning in honour and reverence for our King. The author of Hebrews here says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, that's you and me, right? We're receiving this kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. You may be seated. How much awe and reverence do we have for God, our Heavenly Father? He asks us to worship Him with reverence and awe. Two things we're going to look at this morning is how do we, rever- how do we worship Him like that? We're going to look at the power of God. Because we show reverence for God by learning how to truly worship Him. Worship isn't just coming on to church on a Sunday and raising your hands and singing a few songs. We're going to go to the scripture and, and see exactly what it is to worship God this morning with reverence and awe. I'm sure everyone here has a, a picture painted of who God is. And I caught up with some people this week that aren't Christians and even they have an idea of who God is. And they were talking about how you know, what's going on in the States and how, uh, how, how God would allow this to happen. And yet, they're not Christians. And they've got a picture of who they think God is. And when someone says, this is who God is, or this is what God stands for, everyone just goes to their own image of who God is. But let's wipe that away for the moment, and let's go to Scripture and actually see who God is, hey? Because we can all get these stories of who or who we want God to be but let's go to scripture and see actually who God is and let's see make sure that lines up and actually our thoughts and and our understanding of who God is actually lines up with biblical scripture because Jesus said that yet a time is coming and has now come when we when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth for they are the kind of worshippers that the Father seeks. Do you know a Heavenly Father seeks our worship? God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. It's not about our favourite song that we get to sing on a Sunday and it's not about our feelings and emotions and we, we go, oh, that was just a really lovely time and warm and fuzzy feelings and it's not about getting some supernatural experience and just holding on to that one experience. No, it's about understanding who God is. Who is this God that we worship? Who is this God? Who is this Jesus that we come and celebrate every Sunday and we get around and get excited about what it is that he's done for us? Who is this heavenly Father that loves us so much that he sent his only son? Who is this guy? And I can't do it justice in 30 to 40 minutes of even trying to explain to you who this God is. I don't know if you could even, I don't know if we could ever capture it because of just how amazing and mighty and, and beyond our wildest dreams and imaginations that he is. But I'm going to give it a crack. Huh? Thank you. To worship in spirit and truth, we can only do that when we truly know who he is. And as we mature in our walk with God, 
don't know about you, but I constantly feel like, man, like five years ago, was I even saved? Like, oh my goodness, my understanding now of who God is and how I approach the throne room now compared to what it was like back then. What was I even doing? How dare I even, even approach God like that? And the more mature we become, the greater we know Him. And the greater we know Him, the greater we worship Him. And the truth of who He is leads us and guides us in everything that we do. Who's all heard the statement, worship is a lifestyle, right? Worship isn't a lifestyle. Worship is be- becomes a lifestyle. Right? It, it constantly grows. It constantly develops. It, it, it should be something that we're growing in all the time. Of this lifestyle of worship. It should be added to every week. It should be added. We should be growing in it. We should be greater in it this week than we were last week. We worship in spirit when our hearts are literally abandoned before the Lord. We're only going to abandon our hearts and our desires and all the things that we want if we truly know him. If we don't know him, we're not going to abandon anything. We're not going to continue on to live our lives the way we want to do it. And it's just going to be a religion act, religious act that we do. But when we truly know him, we literally get to church on a Sunday to celebrate him. We, we wake up Monday morning and our hearts are abandoned before him. And we go, because of who you are, God. It's not my life I'm living. So I wonder why Paul said those words. So no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. Because of his maturity in Christ. Because of his maturity of how much he had grown to know. I mean, he had all this amazing understanding of who God was prior to his conversion, right? Probably way more than you and me. How much reverence and awe do we come we, on a Sunday, when we come around the Word of God, do we go, hold up, everything's got to stop, he's reading from the Word. Literally reading God's Word. Literally, the God, of the Creator of the universe put a book together for us to lead us and guide us. Is anything more important? Is there anything more important than the Word of God? How do we come around that word? How do we come around and go, oh my goodness, God, look what you've given us. Nothing else matters. In our immaturity, we sit there and we chat to the person next to us and we scroll our phones and we go, what's going on next? Oh, what am I doing after church? What's happening this week? Man, work is so busy at the moment. In our immaturity, in our lack of knowledge of who God is, I feel like we take his grace that he's given us for granted so much, hey. I know I personally have. Go, oh, yeah, but we're under grace now, so we can pretty much do what we want. No, we can't. That's not, that's not the message of grace at all. It's not the message of this God that, that loves us. That, that, that commands our reverence and awe before him. You know, we can try our hardest to, to learn what this reverence and awe is and then you know, one day we're going to die and we're going to stand before him and then we'll really know what it's like to, to be in reverence and awe of him. <laughs> we're going to read some stuff today about people that have actually come before God and what that's actually like. The trembling and the fear set before man as you approach God. Oh my goodness. Our minds need to be filled with biblical understanding of God's nature if we're going to truly worship him. To worship God is to know him and out of knowing him to serve him. To worship the way that he deserves to be worshipped we must align our hearts with his hearts. And we must seek every day just to obey the things that he asks us to do. What next God? What next God? What next God? What are we doing next God? Our God is a consuming fire. Let's take a look at what, what God did when he created the earth. Back in Genesis, the first thing he says is, let there be light. Hey, oh, not the first thing, but one of the things he says when he created the earth. Let there be light. When he says, let there be light, what happened? <coughs> you know, we wake up and you know, there's sunshine. It's a beautiful day. Woohoo! Let's take a look at that for a moment. According to NASA... 
The sun's core is 15 million degrees Celsius. 15 million degrees. That's nuts, isn't it? The sun's surface is 5,500 degrees. The sun's diameter is 1.4 million kilometres. Means that 1.3 million Earths can fit into the sun. Isn't that crazy? And we just wake up and take this for granted every day, don't we? Who thought about that this morning when they woke up? <laughs> God, I wonder how many suns can, how Earths can fit into our sun. I wonder how hot it is. It has always baffled me. I light my fire and I've got to put more fuel on it to keep it going. It goes out. Where's the sun's getting the fuel from? I don't see any timber up there. <laughs> How's it still burning? Is anyone else fascinated by that? Blows my mind. According to the National Geographic, Every second, right? Not, not every minute, not every hour, not every year. Every second, the sun fuses around 620 million metric tons of hydrogen into helium. Every second this is going on so you and I can have life here on Earth. Oh, there goes another 620 million. Oh, there goes another 620 million. Another 620 million. Another 620 million. <laughs> they can't even keep up with it. And that's what God did when he created light. Let there be light. Bang, this happens. Wow. What happens when you say let there be light? Flick a light switch. Woo! It's great. And God says let me light. This is going on. All right? And our sun is only one of about 400 billion stars in our galaxy. 400 billion, not 400, 400 billion, not 400 million, 400 billion stars. That's a lot of stars. How do they even count them? <laughs> right? This is amazing how they count stars. Our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across, right? The Milky Way galaxy. So that means if you travel at the speed of light, who knows what speed of light is? That 300,000 uh, kilometres a second, right? You have to travel at 300,000 kilometres a second for 100,000 years just to get to the other side of the Milky Way galaxy. Now, God created this. What did you create? <laughs> Pastor Jess is doing this um, thing at uni at the moment where she's got to be creative and create all these things. And out of clay, she made this little flower. She's like, oh, look at my flower. It's really cool. <laughs> look at the universe. <laughs> I've gone, wow, how did you do that? <laughs> Hang on, let's just look up for a minute. Wow, how did you do that, God? This is the God that we serve. Not some distant, mystical creature, made up thing. This is our king that we serve. All right? In fact, our known universe, according to NASA from 2006, have worked out that it's about 94 billion light years across. Our known universe. And it just keeps getting bigger. They're like, hey, build another telescope, we'll see a bit further. And God said, He holds us in the palm of His hand. He holds the universe in the palm of his hand. 94 billion year, light years. So that means you've got to travel at 300,000 kilometres a second for 94 billion years just to get to what we know is the end of our universe, or the known universe, right? Do we serve a big God? Are you feeling really small right now? He's a big God. What else can this God do? Well, we heard last week, he can shut the mouths of the lions. Literally. And Taylor's message last week spoke about in Daniel where he got thrown into a lion's den. All these hungry lions ready just to have a feed and God just shuts their mouth. I'm not eating today, guys. 
you're fasting. Uh, but tomorrow you're going to have a feast. Can you shut a lion's mouth? In fact, can you shut a whole bunch of lion's mouths? Our God can. And he did. In fact, he was with people in the fire when it was so hot, those that threw his people into the fire died because of how hot it was. And he just walked in there with them. Got your back, guys. I mean, look, if he can make uh, a sun at, you know, quadrillion degrees, he can stand the fiery furnace. That's literally nothing for him. It's like a 34 degree day for us. It's like, oh, shorts and t shirt weather, guys. Come in with you. She's all good. And they walk out with not a hair singed. This is the God we serve. He's able to physically push back the waters so the Israelites can cross through the Red Sea. Every time I go to physically push water back, more water comes in. Do it all the time, down the beach. You know, digging sandcastles and things, trying to hold the water out. More water comes back. Yeah, at his command, the seas, they just spread. The wind engulfs the seas and pushes it back. And he rescues his people. This is the God we serve. You know, he would draw near to his people in the Old Testament, but always on his terms. Because when, anytime we would draw near to him and and maybe come into the tabernacle, into the place of the Holy of Holies to go and see this God, he'd just die. Couldn't do it. Right? In Exodus 19, we're going to read here where um, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them to them today and tomorrow have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. And he says, put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or even touch it. For even if your foot touches it, whoever touches the mountain will be put to death because this is where he's going to reside. God's coming down on his terms to meet with his people. He is so powerful that if we were to go and walk into that presence, we'd just die. So on the morning on the third day, there was thunder and lightning. Who enjoys a bit of a thunderstorm? Huh? Good fun. And then a thick cloud covers the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Who's been surprised by a, a, a bolt of lightning and a roar of thunder before? Like I reckon times that by like a gazillion, right? And this is what it would have been like at this mountain if you were one of these people at the time. As God comes down, everyone is in, in fear. Everyone is freaked out. What on earth is going on? Then Moses says, come on guys, let's go meet God. So trembling, off they go, shaking, holding each other. You know, it's great when you're in a group because you kind of spur each other on. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. Smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace and the whole mountain trembled violently. At the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. Could you imagine being there? How would you then approach God when you've experienced that? I wouldn't approach him on my phone. Because I'd probably accidentally touch the mountain and die. Isaiah 40 verse 12 
It says, who else has held the oceans in his hands? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and the hills on a scale? Sometimes we need to be reminded of who God is. And who, we, who, who do we serve? I want to read from Job this morning. There's like four chapters. I'm not going to read all of it because it would just take forever. I'd love to read all of it if you just wanted to stay. It's like two o'clock this afternoon because I just, I'm fascinated with, our, with my lack of understanding of who God is. Let's read it. It's not on the screen, so if you've got your Bibles, it's Job 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkness counsels by the words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man, I will question you, and you will make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On where was its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut the seas with doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I make clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribe limits for it and set bars and doors and said, this far you shall come and no further and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Who's been down the ocean before on a surf beach and tried to stand the force of a wave? Just flattens you, doesn't it? Like you surfers would know. You, you get up on a wave and it just smashes you literally onto the seabed. You are face planting the sand and you're thinking, am I ever going to get up? And you're trying to push up, but all the might of this wave is just holding you down and pinning you down. And you can feel your boards just stretching off at a million miles. And you go, don't break, don't break, don't break, don't break. Because, <laughs> you know, if that leg rope breaks and your board goes, then you've got another wave coming after that. It's terrifying. Man, I, everyone should surf anyway, by the way. Because you need to experience it. It's so much fun. Huh? Have you commanded the mornings since your days begun and caused dawn to know its place? Oh, man, I'll just wake up. <laughs> I'll wake up and you've done it for me, God. But this is what God's saying to Job. Did you get up this morning and command the sun to come up? And then you did put it to bed when it was time for it to go. No, I did that. You just woke up. That it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked shall be shut out of it. It is changed like clay under the seal and its features stand out like that of a garment. From the wicked their lights would be withheld and their uplifted arms broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked the recess of the deep? Have the gates of the depths been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of the deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? What we just did this morning. Declare if you know this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? Where is the place of darkness? That you may take to it its territory. And that you may discern the paths to its home. You know, for you were born then, right? (laughs) Nope. And the number of your days is great. Not that great. Have you entered the storehouse of the snow? Or have you seen the storehouse of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? How cool is that? There's a storehouse up there. It's pretty cool to know, isn't it? What is the way to the place where the light is distributed? Or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Who has a cleft, a channel for the torrents of rain and a way for the thunderbolt to bring the rain on the land where no man is or, or on the desert where there is no man? A lightning bolt. 
Who, who likes power? A lightning bolt has so much power, right? How many lightning strikes do you reckon are happening around the world right now? A couple? 10? 20? Try 8.6 million in a day. According to the National Weather Service, on average there is 100 lightning strikes worldwide every second. An average of 8.6 million per day. That's a lot of power. And when I read this, I love storms, I love lightning, I went, I don't know how much power is in a lightning bolt. So then I went and Googled this and found this, I thought it was really cool. A single bolt of lightning has enough energy to power more than 850,000 homes or a small town. Well, this is a small town, I don't think we've got 850,000 homes here. For an entire day, one bolt of lightning. That's a lot of power. You and I aren't throwing them out. God's orchestrating them to show us how just awesome he is. Isn't that amazing? Has the father... Has the rain a father, or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb did the ice come from? You don't have to worry about the ice melting, people. Okay, God's got it under control. It's his ice. And who has given birth to the frosts of heaven? The waters become hard like stone. The face of the deep is frozen. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loosen the cords of the Orion? You know the constellations of stars up in the sky? And God's saying to Job, dude, look up. Look at the Pilates. You do anything about them? I'm just twiddling them with my fingers. I can do whatever I like. What, what can you do? Come on, man, how good are you? Look what I did. Can you loosen the belt around the Orion that I put up there? This is literally the God that we serve. Can you lead forth? Uh, where are we? Can you lead forth the Mazaroth in their seasons, which is the whole thing of stars and constellations? Or can you guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinance of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you? I can't. Can you send forth lightning that they may go and say to you, here we are, what do you want us next? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds by wisdom or who can tilt the water skirts of the heavens when the dust runs into masses and the, cloud, the clods stick fast together? There's, there's three more chapters of God just bragging up literally about how good he is. Don't you know? You just take all this for granted, don't you know? Right now you're sitting there taking everything for granted, don't you know? It's four chapters of it. I'd encourage you to read it. It's just mind-boggling. Our God appeared to the Israelites in a consuming fire on a mountain. Scared the living daylights out of them. So much so that they were like, Moses, you go. We ain't going back there. <laughs> you go talk to that God. But it had nothing to do with his presence. His presence is terrifying. You know, we can get to Sunday and we can sing some songs and have some worship time and go, oh, I felt the presence of God this morning. Man, if you really felt the presence of God, I don't reckon this building would be here. What we, I believe this firmly, what we have experienced in getting close to God is so nothing compared to what is available to us. If we'll just grasp who this God is that we serve. 
And you know what? When we grasp it, we realize that our lives literally don't even matter. His does. Our ways don't matter. His does. But we only get that revelation when we get to know who God is. We can know about God and it won't change our lives. Transformation comes when the Holy Spirit reveals to us who God is, who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And then it transforms our lives. And each day we should be worshipping him greater, out of a greater passion and a greater understanding of who he is. Our God is a consuming fire. And he desires to be reverenced and held in awe when we come together. When you wake up tomorrow morning, he desires to be held in reverence and awe, not just for us to get up and go on about our day. There's this song, I don't know who sings it, because I'm terrible with song names and people that sing songs and remembering their names. But the line of it goes, God, I don't want to abuse your grace. And that's just my heart resounding life command at the moment. God, I don't want to abuse your grace. And yet we do. We're just constantly, I'm constantly abusing his grace. I'm constantly taking it for granted. I'm constantly, constantly abusing what Jesus did on the cross for me. As I forget him and go and do what I want to do. And think that my life matters. When, when we stand before God, we get one chance at this life on earth. One, one chance. You're not going to get another one. This is it. We're going to make our lives count. We're going to understand who it is that we're serving. We're going to realise that we're more than enough because what Jesus has done, we're going to get off our backsides and go and do stuff for him and live for him and love him and, and immerse ourselves in him and give him the reverence and all that he deserves. Reverence for God is demonstrated by our willingness to voluntarily die to ourselves and obey his commands. And we only do that when we get to know him, not know of him. When you get to know him, because when you see people that know of him, they don't live for him. And they know of him. Paul says in Galatians, I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I that live. My life is not worth anything anymore, but, I, but Christ lives in me. Now it's worth everything because now Christ is in me, guys. So now what am I doing? I'm doing what Christ would want me to do. I'm literally his hands and feet everywhere I go. I'm missional about him, about his life, about his purpose. That's all I live for. This is what I've got to aspire to and we just don't get there overnight. We get there by getting to know God, who he is. Who is this God that we serve? What does he ask of us? He says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And Jesus says in Luke 6, he says, uh, (laughs) this blows me away. He goes, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And don't do what I say. Because they know he's Lord. But they don't actually know him. We can go around professing where we know God. We might know of him. We might know of Jesus. But unless our hands and feet actually get to work, I mean, there's nothing, literally nothing we can do to earn our salvation. Literally nothing. But when we get to know him, we realize that our life is gone. Our life is buried. Our life is with the cross. It is no longer us that live. We made that decision that we're going to partner with you, Jesus. We thank you. Thank you for saving me, for living my own life and stuffing it up. Because you know what? When I live for myself, it's dumb. It's full of worldly purpose and worldly meaning, which means absolutely nothing. Because when you're dead and six feet under, like everyone's going to be, who did you live for? Everyone's going to give an account for their life. Every single person. You You don't get a sidestep from it. We're literally going to stand before this king. We need to make this life count. We need to make this time count. We get one chance. I feel like the Western church waters down God's reverence and awe to Jesus is just my buddy. You know, who's Jesus to you? He's my best friend. Jesus is a friend of mine. I have a friend in Jesus. I do even know, know him. 
Because if I know him, I know his heart and I know what he's about. And then that's what I'm about. That's what my life is about. My life is no longer about my things and what I want to go and do. My life is literally pursuing. It's not wasted on me anymore. It's not wasted on all the things that I want to see and I want to do and I want to become. Put the spotlight on me. It's not wasted anymore. It's like the best thing ever. We now get to live this life where we're living with Jesus literally in us. Now And now we can literally approach the Heavenly Father because of what Jesus has done. Because in, in the Old Testament, worship was always done at a far. You were told worship, but worship from a distance, right? You can't get close to me. You get close to me, I'll kill you just because of who I am. I, you cannot get close to me. It's gone, right? There was a tabernacle set up. It's a visual reminder of the separation between God and, and people. You can't enter my presence. And, and yet God would draw near because he desires relationship. He desires you. He yearns for you. He wants you. So he would draw near because he knew the limits that he could go without you dying. So he would draw near and he would give the ability for just one person to come into the Holy of Holies just once a year. Once a year. <laughs> and then there's a story in there about the, kid, the kids go in to go and see God and they die. And he's like, dude, we need to tell Aaron not to let anyone else go in there because you just die. You walk in, you literally just die. Don't go in there until I've called you. That's what it was like for people like you and me, Gentiles, Right before the cross. You could know about God, you could worship him from afar. And then comes Jesus. This gets me emotional every time. Because I don't think we truly understand love. Could you think about the most worst person in the world ever to be created, ever to be made, ever to have lived... And God so loved that person. How do you go loving someone that hates you? That's the least thing I want to do. Nothing in me wants to love them. And yet his love for you and me, sinners before we come to know him, some of us hated God. For the worst of the worst, for those that literally weren't worth anything to us. Jesus said that, I'll go. Come on. And his life on earth, he knew what was coming. His life on earth, everything he was trying to train and teach and get across to his followers so that they would go on and train and teach. And, and one thing he's asked us to do is go and make disciples. So many people that make disciples, that make disciples, that make disciples. In the new creation of who we are. This is the thing I love about the CRC. It's just birth in new creation. I just want everything we talk about to be new creation because this is now who we are, but we need to understand the God that we serve. Jesus comes, gets beaten and flogged until he's hardly recognisable. For you today. So you could come before your father of what was actually meant to be like. You know, it cost him everything. God, I don't want to abuse your, your grace, hey? It literally cost him everything. Do we understand that? What does it cost you? Has it cost you everything? Or are we just in Western world living a life of comfort and enjoyment? And pleasure. Matthew 27. Jesus, he's on the cross. He's been beaten. And then what he cries out. It is finished. He knew the job he had to do. An innocent man to be the blood sacrifice 
for you and for me, for everyone out there. And we just sit on our hands, cushy life that we live. Who are we telling about Jesus and what he's done? God, I want to abuse your grace. I need your mercies new every day. I want to sit on my hands. I want to make my life count. And at that moment, when Jesus cried out to the Father, It is finished! The curtain tore in the tabernacle. There was no one in there tearing it. They would have been dead. God's Spirit tore the temple. Tore the curtain in the temple. So you and I can now approach a Heavenly Father as we were created to do so. The earth shook. So much so rocks split open. And yet for a moment, just imagine what that would have been like standing there. Terrifying. The God we serve, yeah, he's love. But he's a love beyond our understanding of love. Our our understanding of love is so pathetic in regards to his, hey. Can I just say that? Can I offend you this morning? Our idea of love, our condition of love. Oh, they hurt me. Oh, they hurt me because I did this for them and then they didn't even say thank you. Don't you know how much that cost me of my time and my effort? And you know what they went and said about me? Boo-hoo! That's not love. It's pettiness. This, this is love. Love is dying for someone that hates you. Love is putting your life on the line for someone that can't stand you. Love for us is going to the world and telling them how much God loves them. What separated us from God being the curtain has been taken down. Christ offered himself once and all to God in the true heavenly temple and opened for us an eternal passageway into the very presence of God by his blood and his body. And with that new covenant comes a command from God. Let us draw near to God. We need to draw near, church, to know him. We need to draw near to understand him. To know what his heart beats for. What does he cry for? What should we be crying for? Who's he concerned about? Who should we be concerned about? It literally cost Jesus his life. So you and I can boldly walk into the throne room of God now. I don't even know if we've ever even got close to doing that. How do we respond to this? What effort do we now respond with? With what of our life do we give this creator? What now takes priority? Polly, you can come up and just play some keys for me. We're going to take communion together this morning, church. And I haven't even begun to touch the tip of the iceberg of God's character and who God is. But Hebrews 12 says he's an consum- all-consuming fire. You know, we, we see him... If you don't have communion, maybe raise your hand. The guys will come around. But God is a consuming fire. He is powerful. He is mighty, right? And when we take this cup, we're pledging our allegiance 
to what Jesus stands for and for what Jesus lives for. This is why it says don't take it lightly. So this morning, you don't have to take this. If you need time to actually sit and meditate on what all this means for your life, do that. Take the time. Who cares if someone's looking at you? Who cares if someone sees you put it in your pocket? Do you not know the God that we serve? He so loves you. He's literally done everything to restore the relationship between you and Him, between the world and Him. And they don't know it yet. We need to get active super excited in a few weeks I get to share where we're going in the next 12 months at our Vision Sunday I believe today's message begins to build on it because when we truly know God when we mature in Christ we stop being immature and we get to know Him and what He's about our life looks different Now as you take your juice and your bread, let's think about the pain and suffering Jesus went through for you and for me. Let's think about what it cost him. Let's think about that love. Let's think about how we've responded to that in the past. What does our life look like now? Has our life just been an abuse of His grace? I know mine has. This holy God. when Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray he taught them the Lord's prayer and he said when you pray, pray like this our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name you know the word hallowed means to be set apart as holy when we come before our God we need to realise just how holy He is. How powerful He is. How mighty He is. You might be sitting here this morning and your life is an absolute mess. God's just calling you. He's going, I got this. You know, I, I got everything. I'm the one that makes the sun rise in the morning and gives you light. I'm the one that puts it to sleep and gives you night very poetic wasn't it he's got this often we battle with hard times in our lives because our lives are our own that's how we know that's how we know we haven't fully yet given our lives to Jesus properly it's a continual path that we're on that we should be growing and maturing in. Because if Paul can be locked up in prison, singing praise to God as he's been stoned and beaten and writing letters of encouragement, that's what the transformed life looks like. allow the Holy Spirit this morning to reveal to you where you're at Jesus we thank you for the cross this is why we come around communion every week it never gets old it just gets deeper and we share with the communion team don't be concerned about saying the same thing over and over again we should be in more awe next week of what it is that we share around communion
We should literally be in greater, deeper awe because of our Monday to Saturday and how we've lived our life, of the power that was in this body, in this bread that we take, and in the power of the blood. We literally should be in a deeper awe and reverence. Jesus, we thank you for your body that was given up for us. We thank you, Lord, for revealing to us the depths that you went to for us. And as we take our communion this morning, we stand. We st- well, let's all stand, hey? Let's stand with him. Standing before God is a sign of honour and reverence and awe and respect. That's why we do it when we get around sharing the word. Jesus, we stand. We stand in allegiance to you, Jesus. And what you stand for, we stand for. What hurts you, hurts us. What you live for, we live for. And we take this bread in remembrance of what it is that you did for us, that we may live this life now in freedom, in love, as a new creation no longer held by the chains of the world, no longer bound by sin, no longer constrained, but free in you. We take this in honour of you, in Jesus' name. We thank you for the cup that represents your blood. It washes us clean every day we stand clean before the Father not because we are righteous in our own right because of you Jesus only because of you and what you've done for us the life that you've now called us to live we go about living we thank you for your blood and its power we thank you that we are washed clean white as snow now we have a relationship with our Heavenly Father Thank you for everything you've done, Jesus. We take this in remembrance of you.